So, hello, thank you very much for coming, uh, Dublin. Um, there's so many things you can do here now. You didn't have to come out at all, you know, because it's not like, not like when I when I lived here, you know, with the horizontal rain and 55 guys around one half pint and Grogan's all fighting over crisps. And the, you know, back then when people all styled their hair with buttermilk and there was four tawny yellow piano pub key teeth between a family, and then. <laughs> It's all transformed after 18,000 million years of that. It's suddenly become kind of mesh of Barcelona and uh, Miami. Everybody's going out with somebody called Fijuvia. And, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and you know it's a sign of a, of a country thriving and a city being very successful when you can't afford to live there. People say, yes, I've got a very easy commute. I live in the Aran Islands. Um, no problem. We live in a tree, yeah. It was only 400,000 euro, but... Uh, <laughs> so, I don't, I don't envy you all that. I'm glad I don't have to deal with that. But, it's, you know, when... I, hello and everything, by the way. I don't spend a huge amount of time on that because I find, you know, it's one of the, it's one of the portals of conversation people get very, very freaked out about. Because you can use hello, and then after that you're on your own, really. You know, you're, <laughs> people get scared after hello. They go, hello. So, <laughs> Do you want a pineapple? They don't know <laughs> what to do next. So I just kind of skip it. Um, but what was I going to say? Quickly, quickly. I can't remember. I can't do everything around here. People think they'll uh, emigrate, and that's it. The, the, the new life will be somewhere else. Much better than here. I can't take it anymore. And where would you go? People, people fling themselves all over the planet. People end up in Australia. Why would anybody want to go there? What is the point of that country? I was, I usually never leave the house, but we all went to Australia recently. The whole family was a ridiculous place. Located three quarters of a mile from the surface of the sun. <laughs> People audibly crackling as they walk past you on the street. That's why they all barbecue. You don't need to cook somewhere like that. You just bring the shit out, fling it on a grill, and it bursts into flames. <laughs> It's not supposed to be inhabited, and when they're not doing that, frying themselves outside, they all fling themselves into the sea, which is inhabited almost exclusively by things designed to kill you. Sharks, jellyfish, swimming knives, they're all in there. <laughs> Science! It's a joke. Look at the scientific explanation for the origin of life as we know it. There's a major flaw. I mean, it's no wonder we have creationists. You know, those people, God love them who tell their children that, you know, originally we all went to school with the dinosaurs, or whatever it is that they tell them. But no wonder they exist, because listen to the, to the, or, the explanation for the origin of life itself. It doesn't sound very scientific. There was a big bang, <laughs> and then we all came from monkeys. <laughs> what, that's it? Yeah, shop's closed, fuck off. I need more than that. There must be more than bang. Ah, 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 honey, I'm home, come on. It's such a boring theory anyway. It's much more interesting if you reverse the order. <laughs> People do need things that are bad for them. They do. Stimulants and so on. They always have. You know, every so often, some politician or footballer or actor or whoever it is is caught in a hotel room surrounded by hookers and cocaine. And everybody else goes, oh, the shame of it, how could he, how absolutely dreadful. I'd never do that. I've never had the chance, but I would never, ever do that. Oh, the disgust that courses through me right now. You could bottle it. But what else are you supposed to give hookers in a hotel room? Yogurt, anybody? I made some yogurt this morning. Would you like some? It's got granola and everything. You sure? Go on, have a bit. Everybody is corrupted by hotel rooms. You can't help it. It's the only place in the world where you walk in and the first thing you do is steal everything before you take your coat off. Bouncing up and down on the bed wearing the shower cap thinking, what can I do in here? Now, I meant to talk about something else earlier on, and I forgot what it was. I've remembered what it is again, but I've also forgotten. And that's really 
what adulthood is like most of the time. You know you spend a lot of time walking back to the room to get the thing that you left the room so that you would go and use it somewhere else and on your way back to the room to get the thing, you forget not only what it is but what room it was in. And you're faced with the people who love you looking at you going, what do you want? Why are you here? And you go, I don't know. You spend an awful lot of time like that. And children aren't like that, and that, which is why they look so young, because they always have a sense of style and purpose. When they're walking around, they have a very definite purpose. They're walking and walking, and it's a great walk as well. It's not an adult sort of bemused shuffle. It's that, I'm going over here. You say, why are you going over there? Because I have a harmonica. What are you doing with a harmonica? I'm going to put it in the toilet. And <laughs> why are you doing that? Enough questions, goodbye. <laughs> Because children express themselves. That's how they look young and vibrant and alive and why we all envy them. The child, you know, the children are, are, can be incredibly uh, difficult to understand when you're grown up. You forget that you were a child. Something simple like a child going to bed. You know, you say bedtime, bedtime, bedtime. That's not what the child hears. What the child hears is lie down in the dark. <laughs> for hours. And don't move. I'm locking the door now. So the child has trouble with that, so of course you make a concession, you read the fairy tale or something, you know, all the wisdom of the world compacted into a little story. And you say there was a little girl lost many, many miles from home, walking through the woods, late, late at night with the creatures all hooting and howling in the bushes around her, stepping over the roots of trees. And she came to the old sty and began to climb it, but it broke, you see. It broke and she fell down. And then, but then when she got herself up, she was all right, and you could see the lights at home. And she began to walk towards home, and then a thing ate her. <laughs> Good night. Night, night. <laughs> you probably sent the child to bed because you were just tired talking to the child, because the child asks you questions. You see, and this is one of the great things about having a child. You look forward to teaching this child about the world and how it works. But the ch ch children, the children, Children are, they're like children, but they're bigger and they're webbed. They, they, they're not really interested in your views on the world. You know, they have their own questions. What, what is the name of the spaces in between the bits that stick out on a comb? I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Well, what do you call the place underneath the kettle? I don't know! Bedtime, bedtime. What are they really? Children, midget drunks, that's what they are. <laughs> you know the old people who greet you in the morning by kneeing you in the face? <laughs> Talking gibberish! <laughs> and you hate you and you all day. They they can't even walk straight. You can put them on an infinite radial plane, they will find the one pedal there and devote their whole day to banging their eye off it. So you have to drive them to an emergency room when you're doing something important, like sitting down. <laughs> they want drunk people's food, you know? You say, what, what are you eating for tea? Tiramisu, fried in sugar. <laughs> they talk like drunks. Time for time for time for bed now, be bedtime. No, 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 no. <laughs> Get into the bath. No! Get out of the bath. No! Do something that's not mindless violence for five seconds, will you? No! Women, women are more supportive of one another around children. If a woman gets pregnant, you know, other women pitch in and they sort of talk about it. And it's far more useful, you know. Men, when men are about to have a child, if they have young male single friends, they're not, they're not so good. You know this, you know, your male friends arrive and they stand there and they look at you and they come and see the baby and they don't really know how to deal with it. You know, they don't get it, because they go, well, I'm here, you know, your house is a medley of disgusting smells. There's nothing to eat. Everybody's wearing bathrobes. There's no bar. I can't fuck anybody. Why am I here? And... <laughs> Women tend to be more mature. You know, men look at breasts the way women look at babies. <laughs> oh, isn't that lovely? And they... If a woman gets pregnant, all the women she's ever met in her whole life 
will appear from all corners of the earth to support her by telling her horror stories of all the pregnancies they've ever heard about. It's fantastic what you're doing. I love the way you're handling this. It won't be like what happened to Michelle. What? What happened to Michelle? Oh, did I say Michelle? I didn't mean to mention that. I'm sorry. Don't worry. She was a fool. She ate vegetables and drank water. The baby came out her ear. You'll be fine. You'll be absolutely fine. Nothing will happen to you. She can't sit down now. Nobody in the family talks to one another. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. I mean, I'm jealous. Hugely jealous of, of my parents' generation. They got everything right, you know, those people who became, who became couples then. And the, you, you, the couples, that's another thing. You don't, you don't, nobody tells you this, that you get couples as friends at a certain age because of children. You know, your child decides they want to play with another child, so you have to meet the owner. <laughs> and have it round to your place to eat your stuff. Or go to their place where you can't relax just because it's always bigger and nicer and cleaner. You're standing there in the bathroom thinking, I can't relax here. These people have no pubic hair anywhere. We have pubic hair on the ceiling. And they're so incredibly competitive, you know? All this sh stuff when you arrive. This is the hall, this is the kitchen, this is the living room. I know. This is the smeg fridge. The whole house is made of smeg. We're made of smeg, aren't we, Roy? Yes. <laughs> Julian's very happy in the local school, in the little grove, in the little arcade there, the little parish school. Multi-denominational, of course. Rastafarian nuns, Zen nuns, they're all there. <laughs> 18 teachers to a child, each one with its own laptop. <laughs> Direct access to the Pentagon. But I, I just think, I don't need all this competition, all right? I only came here because you said you had a fucking chicken. <laughs> you have friends who don't have kids they can sound very naive you know you have single friends without children or just people without children because they ask you stupid things like what did you do at the weekend uh, as you try to distinguish one moment from any other in the blur of screams stains and tears that made up Saturday and Sunday they will tell you what they did which is all they ever wanted to do in the first place we went to that really cool place. You know the one you haven't heard of? Yeah, they make their own tomatoes out of vodka. It was great. And then um, we walked along the canal. We hired one of those hop on, hop off hot air balloons, just so in case we got bored walking, you know, we could get in the balloon for a bit and then we could walk for a bit. And then, uh, yeah, I think we saw some French double bill of old movies, you know, which reminded us we hadn't had sex in about half an hour. So we did again. And then um, we went and uh, we did that, uh, you know, we're both in a band. Yeah, it's doing really well. It's called Black Yogurt. We did this sort of lunchtime gig. And. Um, in that really, really cool place, you know, the cellar that's above the building. It's, uh, it's called Umlaut. Well, it's not called Umlaut, it's just two dots over a U that isn't there. And then... Um, we saw loads of people from all over the world and saw several art galleries and went to about five operas and some production of ballet. It was really good. I think I was in it. And, uh, and then we, we, we had sex again and, uh, yeah, then we just ended the evening with some of that, you know, Japanese pizza. It's on stilts. It's really nice. And, the, and then it comes back to you what you did! You go, oh, yeah, I remember. I scraped hardened weed bricks off the kitchen tabletop for two and a half hours, and then I tried to have a shit. It, it, it didn't quite work out, but there's a window on Wednesday, I think. You should come round, we'll make an evening of it. I, mean, I, mean, I don't think children are the same now. They're not the, like the ones I remember from growing up, you know? Being at parties and you do all the childhood things, running around and bleeding and <laughs> torturing the weakest member of the group, you know? <laughs> Simple childhood games. It's not like that anymore. I went to a birthday party recently of a young person. They were all about ten. And, and they, they, they were all slumped on the lawn like dead bumblebees. <laughs> drinking latte. <laughs> they were all disaffected. Like Berlin in 1929. What's going on? I went up to one boy. I said, what's the matter here? He said, oh, I have a migraine. <laughs> You can get drowned or electrocuted, you can't have a fucking migraine. <laughs> and the birthday girl, I, I asked her, I said, why isn't anybody playing? And she said, oh, it's all these parties. <laughs> you do your hair, you put your frock on, nobody talks to the real you. <laughs> get me a martini, would you? <laughs> it's a terrible moment when your own child turns around to you and says, Daddy, is this organic? Excuse me? I 
grew up on Angel Delight. That's the main course. We didn't get food in the house unless it was neon. It took three seconds to prepare. So my parents could carry on with their lives. Love is incredibly uh, mysterious, as you know. And it's still the thing that troubles most people for a lot of their lives until they work it out, and which you may, may do eventually. You hear the conversations in the restaurants, the lovers speaking to one another, and it never really changes. People compete with one another as they're telling each other that they love each other. I love you. I love you. Yeah, but I really love you. I mean, I love you. I love pencils you have sucked and thrown away 20 years ago. I, I love your eyebrows and your ancestry and everything about you. Just eat your food and let me love you. Don't speak. And they don't know, of course, at the time that that dialogue is just from a very bad science fiction film written by nature. Really what they're saying to one another is, uh, the race must continue. The race must continue. My vedudium is pointing at your thranungulator. The race must continue. <laughs> and if they don't handle it properly, you see them 40 years later, the same people in the same restaurant, if you have the time, you go there and you see them and they communicate in a different way now, in middle age. In some cultures it's called silence. Unless I'm missing something and they're saying a lot with the fork hitting the plate. And if their eyes do meet this time, it's not intimacy, it's embarrassment. The man makes that noise as he chumps his chop. In his throat, a kind of horrible sound is <laughs> Sounds like a Balkan curse. And the woman has her own noise of disquiet there. <laughs> and she's spearing her salad. Like a, you know, sounds like a dove having a dump. And then they... <laughs> They go home to the bed they've shared for, sh sheared. When you shear a bed, it, it's, it, it's a difficult process. It, you know when you go home, you're a bit, uh, you had a couple of drinks and the bed's all woolly. And you have to, get, <laughs> you have to get the clippers out. Here we go again. Don't move. Mm, and they, and when they've sheared the bed, they share it. And they get in with the, and they have real intimacy which takes years to achieve, you know. You're not going to get it with somebody you don't know very well. Not that there really is such a thing as casual sex. What is that? What is that supposed to be? It's never really casual. You always have to turn up. And the... <laughs> it's never casual unless you're both wearing Sherlock Holmes hats or something and you're covered in crisps. One of you's eating an omelette, the other one's doing a crossword. Then it's kind of casual. <laughs> I'm talking about real intimacy, where people don't mess around with all that manipulating the phrase, I love you. People, you get this all the time. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Bake me a cake or go away. <laughs> I don't want to make any huge generalizations about women, you know. No, I'm not here to do that. It's uh, vulgar. But all I'll say is that they have no feelings. <laughs> Because it's actually men, you'll find, who are far more romantic. Men is, are the people you will hear say, I found somebody. She's amazing. If I, don't, if I don't get to be with this person, I'm fucked. I can't carry on. I, mean, I know I mean it. I, she's totally transformed my life. I have a job, I have a flat. It means, means nothing. I can't stand it. I have to be with her. Because if I don't, I'm going to end up in some bedsit. I'll be alcoholic. I'll have itchy trousers. I can't. I can't walk the streets anymore. That is how women feel about shoes. People, you have a very important early decision to make in your life. Are you going to be alone? Are you going to be with somebody else? Are you going to be sane or not lonely? <laughs> a couple is a strange thing. It's an organism that's half as intelligent as the most intelligent member. And you both know who that is. Because you've got two people walking around together all the time trying to remember all the different shit they have to lie about to each other. But well, we're going over here, are we? Oh, good. Are we going to see those people? Terrific. Oh, good. I don't hope it doesn't stop anytime soon. And 
There's a lot of pressure on you to find the right person. You're told if you don't find the right person, your life is fucked. It's my advice to forget the whole thing. You're dead. Which is rubbish. There's billions of you. We're all the fucking same. If it's not him, it's be her. Or if it's not him, it'll be them. There's millions of people for everybody. There's more than enough. We're very overstocked on ourselves. But it's because we all think we're so fabulous. The first half of your life is all spent getting over yourself anyway. You know, you would think you're amazing, unique. Young people walking around going, you know, the funny thing is, I was just in the kitchen, but now I'm here in the bedroom. Get a load of me, I just go on and on. And, and that's around the age when you meet somebody else and you're totally unbearable. Two young, fit, healthy, attractive people in love. There's nothing worse to look at in the world. Going around going, I can't believe I met you because I'm amazing and you're amazing and we're surrounded by shitheads. It's just amazing. <laughs> hey, I know this really good bar. Let's go and make it better. <laughs> the questions that everybody asks now are the questions that everybody has always asked about each other. You know, you still hear all this stuff, what do women want? As though it's really mysterious, as though it's a big deal. All a woman wants is what anybody wants. You know, friendship and companionship and respect and a certain amount of leadership with submission and a <laughs> kind of cooperation at all times and a preemptive empathy and, you know, general telepathy. It's no big deal, is it? <laughs> And then when the same questions are asked of men, what is it that men want? You're always told that it's really very simple. You know, it's something like lingerie. <laughs> now, historically, there hasn't been a big demand for male lingerie from women because there's a limited amount you can do with male genitalia. There's a limited amount you can do with anything that looks like it's hanging out of the side of a shark's mouth. And... <laughs> It doesn't really matter if you put a velvet gown around it, it's not going to do the trick. <laughs> We're told that this is what, what men want, lingerie, you know? To, to, for women to look like cakes. <laughs> it's not enough that you want to be with me and love me, you must first be a French fancy. And, <laughs> you now women don't want that. Traditionally, women have been attracted to uniforms. So it's not difficult to know what women want. Fascists, that's really what they're all after. <laughs> you cannot overestimate how infantile men are about sex. Men are people who have sex because they have a headache. <laughs> or are on fire, or have been shot in the head, or whatever it is. <laughs> and the arguments do seem to be unfairly racked. In, 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 in women's favour because of the, the, I think the arguments are made in different places. All male arguments are very early 70s, Soviet made, unidirectional, trundling behemoths that say the same thing again and again and again. You know, I told you I would be late on Tuesday. I told you I would be late. I said it. I heard my own voice. I did say it. I told you. Whereas women seem to have these amazing, slinky stealth bombers designed by Jaguar with a lovely cream leather interior and infinite torque. That's why they can respond by saying, yes, maybe, all right, but why is the fridge door open? I don't understand. I don't understand. <laughs> Women have memories. Short, medium, long, they've got it all. A woman remembers something you said 17 years ago. And the way you looked at her just now. <laughs> and to aid that memory, the woman would open a hat box full of precious things. The curly whirly wrapper that meant so much. A bundle of ladders too painful to look at or throw away. They have to be kept so they can never be looked at. I heard a terrible story. I, I, I didn't even, I, I didn't think this kind of thing happened. But this happened, this guy knows a guy, it happened. The guy I know knows another guy. It happened to him, I'm very well connected. And he told me this man was in bed with his, with his person and they were making love. And she actually called out the wrong name. I didn't think that could happen. She called out the wrong name. And when I heard that, I thought, how would you ever recover from something like that? You'd be destroyed. 
But then I realized, you know, it wouldn't even have to be the wrong name. Somebody could just say your name in the wrong way. Because everybody wants to hear, oh, John. But you don't want to hear, John. <laughs> or, John. <laughs> Well, the very worst. Like, you know, patronizing, comforting one. Oh, John, you do. <laughs> These things can change your life. <laughs> or oh, when people break up, they always use a bunch of lines on, on, on each other. You know, terrible, rubbish lies. Like, it's not you, it's me. It's, it's me. It's never you, it's always them. <laughs> you should level with these people. Tell them. You know that strange sound you used to hear when you were going asleep? That was me chewing the bed. <laughs> Out of sheer boredom. Oh, how I hate you. I hate you so much it gives me energy. I have to get up early in the morning to hate you because there isn't time enough in the day. Please go away. Or oh, that other bullshit. I need more space. People never quantify exactly how much space they need, do they? But strangely enough, it all seems to be the exact same height, depth, and breadth as you. <laughs> Sometimes I'd love to be like you. Cool and calm and unemotional. Protestant, in short. <laughs> what a... It's, it's a fantastic religion. It makes absolutely no demands upon you at all, which is why it's not a great religion. All great religions are built on shame. You don't have any of that if you're Protestant. You go to the church, you sing a few hymns, have a cup of tea, everybody goes home and has a wank. <laughs> you see, you have the freedom of mind to walk into a room and see a, a plate of biscuits, say. And you look at them and you think, well, there's a plate of biscuits. I might have a biscuit, I might not, I might have one later. I might put it in my pocket and give it to somebody else. I don't really mind, it's just a biggie. <laughs> it's not like that if you're Catholic. You walk in the room, you see the plate of biscuits, there could be other things going on in the room. The room could be on fire. It could be full of naked clowns killing each other with crossbows. This doesn't matter to you because all you see is the plate of biscuits. Because you think, oh no, I'm going to eat them. I know I am. I'm going to eat them. I'm going to eat them all. Oh no, I know I am. I'm even walking towards them. I wasn't aware of that, but I am now. I've actually started to eat the biscuits. Help me, help me. Oh, they're delicious. Oh, the shame, the shame, the shame. Oh, I can't tell which is nicer. The biscuit or the shame? It's a child's biscuit, that's perfect. I don't deserve a grown-up one with dark chocolate on it. Oh, they're so nice, now they're all gone. The shame, the shame, that's all I've got left. Nothing can make me feel better now, except cocaine. Because this it was just sort of decided in the 20th century that religion is basically a formalized panic about death. That's all. I mean, look at the Catholic Church, the campest organization on the planet with the purple robes, gold bits on the side, jewelry so big if they let it fall it will kill people. What else can it be but this sort of ritual of panic about death? Death is coming, quick, put on the gold hat. There... I was in this bar a couple of years ago. I will never forget this. It was called, uh, I don't know, the, 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 this song came on rather. And, and it was because the bar was terrific, it was empty, you know? I went in, I had a paper or a book with me, I just wanted an hour, you know, to sit and be. And, and uh, it was wonderful, nothing nicer than an empty bar. And um, then this song came on, I will never forget it. It was called The Funk Soul Brother. I'll always remember that because it was also all of the lyrics. And. Uh, <laughs> It was that school of songwriting, you know, very easy on the words in case they get wasted. I don't know why there's a shortage. And it, was, it sounded like a million fire engines chasing 10 million ambulances through a war zone. And it was played at a volume that made the empty chair beside me bleed. And, <laughs> and it went, um, the funk soul, brother, right about now. Yeah, it's the, it's the funk soul, brother. Check it out. It's, uh, well, it's Funk Soul Brother, essentially. He's, uh, he's coming. He's coming at you. Funk, 
I was Mr. Funk's old brother. And um, after a while, I began to penetrate the meaning of this song, you know. I gathered that somebody was about to arrive and everybody else was terribly excited. Maybe he was bringing cake or something, they didn't say. But he, you see, the thing was, the thing is, he wasn't there yet. <laughs> that was the hook. And I'm not saying it's a bad song, you know, or anything like that. All I'm saying is that you could get, a, I don't know, a broom, say, and dip it in some brake fluid and put the other end up my arse and <laughs> stick me on a trampoline in a moving lift and I would write a better song on the wall. That's all I'm saying. It vanishes on you. It's such a surprise. That's why people say it seems like yesterday. It does. It seems like yesterday to me. It seems like yesterday to me. I was out drinking tequila with my friends. I mean, tequila. It's not even a drink. It's just a way of getting the police around without using a phone. <laughs> now, I'm on the phone to those same friends asking them for recipes. How do you make breadcrumbs? <laughs> you think, Jesus, what's happened to me? Please don't let me die in a gardening center. Don't let me turn into one of those people who begins every single fucking conversation with the words, I'm not a racist, but... <laughs> and you see, because you, you have this illusion all the time that you're cool. People do. It's not just younger people, everybody thinks that. All men do. 99.9% .9 of men are convinced that they have to live silently with the bitter irony of the twist of fate that means nobody knows they're really a spy. <laughs> and an amazing guitarist. Men give serious time and thought to how would I deal with it if a rocket came out of that alley right now, would I? Yeah, I think I'd handle the situation pretty well. Um, a spy who plays guitar at night. And they... And I basically think, I, you know, I'm what would have happened if James Dean had lived and discovered carbohydrates in orthopedic shoes. <laughs> you have to tell yourself this bullshit just to keep going. Because you're constantly being reminded how redundant you are. How am I supposed to feel in the swim of what's current when I, I don't understand what's going on? Because younger people, my children, steal the future by changing language, everything I relied on. You walk down, like, can you expect to, to feel you know what's going on when you walk down the street and your children say, oh, look at that church, it's so random. <laughs> what, is it moving? What do you mean, what are you talking about? It's a perfectly ordinary church where people go to get married. Marriage, Ugh, that's so gay. Look, just, can we just have some quiet time? Here's some crisps, there you go. Crisps! Awesome! <laughs> They're not awesome! They're crunchy! <laughs> if I open them and haggard shafts of lies and cherubim and angelic music comes out, they would be awesome, okay? It is much more difficult to be female, I, I, I grant you that. Because the body's more complicated. You know, if you're b born a woman, all these things happen to you. You're a baby, then a child, then a girl, then a w girl, woman, and all these things are going on. It's this constant opera where the masks keep falling to the floor throughout your life. Who am I? I don't know. Watch out, I'm fucking nuts. And then, <laughs> if you're a male, you know, you're born, you have a finger up your nose and the other hand on your dick, and you get taller. And that is really it. <laughs> It's fairly amazing to think of the, the, the ludicrous taboos that persist amongst us informed, intelligent, able people just from biology. For all these years, it is still a difficult thing to talk about menstruation with a woman if you're male. And you find this out as a young man very quickly. Because you're talking to somebody and you're saying, listen, listen, I agree with everything you're carving on the kitchen table. I do. I really, really do. But do you think it's possible that you may feel this way, perhaps, because of your pip <laughs> Do 
that first high kick to the thorax generally does the trick. <laughs> if you address the subject at all thereafter, it's always in the most feeble way. You go, yes, yes, I know, <laughs> yes. Have you seen the moon? You don't. <laughs> but it's a myth that men don't have their own version of PMT. Of course they do. Every woman knows this. It's a very simple experiment to conduct. All you've got to do is be with the man, wait until he starts doing something, and then go up and talk to him. <laughs> what? What is it now? I'm opening fish fingers, can't you see? <laughs> you come in there, you're walking on the floor, breathing the air like it's yours, talking and talking, I'm doing something. Look, they've fallen on the floor. Are you happy? Are you happy now? Every time I try and do something for myself, you carbonize and then shit on my dreams. <laughs> You're just like your whole family. Why do I even dare to think I could dream, I could imagine, I could hope? <laughs> there are times, I think, when every man is gets very envious of women. And you want to be a woman sometimes just to be able to say the things they say, you know? I asked a woman I was with once, simple question. I said, have you ever eaten pheasant? It's silly, it's direct, isn't it? It's enclosed, it contains everything that needs to be said. And she said a wonderful thing. She, she said, um, uh, she thought about it. And she said, uh, not really. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> On any level? Did you suck it and throw it away? <laughs> Did somebody drop it in your drink? What happened? <laughs> Was it a speeding car? One lick? What? What? <laughs> Guys are changing. Men. Now, they don't want, basically, uh, there's loads of it here. I've noticed loads of it in this country. Um, and there's loads of it uh, where I live. And you look at them, and it, it just hit me one day very forcefully. They don't want to grow up, because they're wearing children's clothes. <laughs> you know, you see loads of guys, and they're in their 30s and 40s, shuffling around in T-shirts with, you know, Zap or Pow or whatever on it. <laughs> and they've got ambiguous length trousers. <laughs> they're not shorts, they're not trousers, they're these, just these things that say, I don't want an executive position anytime soon, okay? I'm having a milkshake for about the next 10 years. Stay the fuck away from me. And they hang around together with another guy and they're not romantically involved. And they stay inside. These are men, remember? Inside the house, playing video games. I think this is amazing. You know what I mean, bip, bip. Bip, bip. I don't understand the names of the, but you know, world of bip. Bip, bip, bip. Milkshake, bip. Zap, bip, 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 bip. A few generations ago at this age, they would have been dead by now. And they're going, bip, dude, you got more bips than me. I am so gay. And I think men get very envious as well as, of, of, the, uh, of the radar, the sensitivity that women have, you know? Because if you say, if a woman friend of a girlfriend, wife, woman friend of yours says, oh, I'm, I'm just gonna go and see so-and-so for, you know, in the cafe for, I'll be back in a little bit. And uh, they come back and say, well, how was so-and-so? Say, oh, she's not so good. Not so good. <laughs> Early onset diabetes. Which is having an affair, which is, you know, complex. <laughs> and uh, there's a very, very good chance she's gonna lose her job as well. And you say, what, that's incredible. You found all that out in 15 minutes? She told you all this? Oh, no, no. She didn't say anything, but she didn't finish your tea. <laughs> which is a good deal more sophisticated than male conversation, you know? But the rules of which are very, very simple. It's your turn to talk when the other guy has the drink up to his face. <laughs> When he takes it away again, he might be on, you know? And you have to stop talking. And of course, you, neither of you can listen to one another when the other one's talking because you're drinking and your head's filling up with fluid. <laughs> That's why men who've known one another for 20, 30 years go home to their wives or girlfriends or whoever's there and, they, and we'll be asked, how was so-and-so? I don't fucking know. <laughs> 
but you were together for eight hours. We just had a drink. Shut up. <laughs> If you want to see a really twisted attitude to pleasure, you have to be talking to an English person because they're very strange. They get very coy and very childish around pleasure. You offer an English person something and they go, <laughs> Well then, if we're going to be a little bit naughty, <laughs> go on then, I'll have a nibble. And you think, it's a fucking bun, eat it. People go a bit mad, I think, in a city especially, you know, because it gets very stressful. People flying the traffic and people flying around, you know, people go strange. They, do, they go for all sorts of weird things that are very bad for them, you know, the gym and yoga and all those <laughs> highly carcinogenic activities that will catch up with you in the end. Or even those really moronic little books, you know, you get now how to release the inner you or find the 95 habits of totally effective tosspots you don't want to talk to in the first place. So. <laughs> Or release your potential. That's another one. Now, that's a very, very dangerous idea. You should stay away from your potential. I mean, that is something you should leave absolutely alone. Don't... Di you'll mess it up. It's potential. Leave it. And anyway, it's like your bank balance. You know, you always have a lot less than you think. You don't look at it. You don't know. Leave it as a kind of the locked door within yourself. And, and that's how it should be. Because then at least in your mind, the interior will always be palatial, you know? <laughs> Wonderful gleaming marble floors, brocaded drapes, mullioned windows covered in mullions, whatever they are. And <laughs> flamingos serving drinks. <laughs> Pianos shooting out canapes into the mouths of elegant men and women who are exchanging witticisms. Yes, this reminds me of the time I was in Budapest with Pinky. <laughs> we were trying to steal a goose from the casino. Pum, <laughs> Volvo. <laughs> Don't open the door. Because it won't be like that. All you're going to see will be one tiny, grey, startling little cat with diarrhoea. <laughs> Sitting on a mattressless, iron-sprung bed with its huge eyes mewing at you. <laughs> Smoking as well, probably. As, as an emphysemic landlady untangles her pop socks in the background. And some terrible guy, the colour of an aubergine, rounds the corner holding a mug of beef tea, wearing a string vest and says, Man, <laughs> That's your potential. But look at the people who use it, who do actually give it everything, you know? Like, great athletes, you know, the Beckhams or Roy Keens of this world. People charging, running up and down the field, swearing and shouting at each other. Are they happy? No! They're destroying themselves. Who's happy? You, the fat fucks watching them. When people get depressed here, they don't really handle it very well. In other cultures, they do something useful. You know, they have a rain dance or they throw stones at one another or something. But here, when people get pissed off, they go, I can't carry on, I don't understand my life anymore, I don't know what I'm doing, I can't fucking handle it, I can't deal with anything, including these cornflakes, I just don't know what's going on. I, I can't do it. <laughs> Fuck it, I'll buy a CD. <laughs> I'll get a CD and a jacket. Fuck everybody. But. Because you're out of your mind, not feeling well, you go and you buy stuff you didn't really want anyway. You know, the Ecuadorian women's folk choir doing the songs of Kenny Rogers. And you bring it back, some canary yellow jacket with purple buttons up the front, and you look at this and you think, what is this shit? What was I thinking? So you take it to a charity shop. That generally is the extent of our charity. We give away all the shit we never needed or wanted in the first place. And that's why charity shops themselves have that incredible funk of depression, the layered smell, and all the women who work in there are 103, and they were 20 when they turned up for work that morning, they just aged in the smell. <laughs> Presumably, as well, there are people going into those shops as well who think, when they look at the stuff, they go, look, that mirror in the shape of a cello covered in seashells is a fucking bargain. Do you have any more of those? Do you? I need about 10. <laughs> If you're not honest about pleasure, if you're not honest about what you want, you'll you be go strange. You turn into one of those freaks, those people who have hobbies. <laughs> you know, somebody gets a load of coat hangers and buttons 
runs into a shed, you don't see them for three days, and then they come out going, look, the Taj Mahal. No, it's not. Put it away. And no, I don't want to see all the plates you've nailed to a bath. Stay away from me, you fucking weirdo. Or the horse you made out of your own hair and spit. Just keep away. And then there's the S&M crowd. And that all sounds very odd at first. You know, people, you know, the ones people like to be nailed and stapled into things. Put in old fridges and left under the stairs for weeks. They love all that. And that, that sounds odd at first. But it has an emotional logic because people speak about it and they say, well, it makes me feel safe. You see? I can see where they're going with that. I mean, I go, you grew up in, I grew up in Ireland and, you know, you learn to feel bad about anything you enjoy. It's in the air. It's Catholicism. You, know, you see a, a sunset. You go, look at that. Isn't that extraordinarily beautiful? We're not allowed. Okay, look at the mud. Look at the mud. The mud everywhere. The mud is mud. I am made of mud. Everything is mud. Mud. Sunsets were for Protestants. I mean, I didn't even know about gay people for a long time when I was growing up. You know? Older, than, much older than I should have been because it was, it was again, it was euphemisms. It was, it was one of those houses, you know, I used to think I was growing up in a musical family. Because people, people would make noises instead of talking about something. Well, you know, you heard about Mary and John and the Ding Dong. Apparently it's all still a bit... Oh. And sometimes they would employ a phrase, if, you know, for something specific, if you can imagine the idea of somebody being gay, they would have a phrase, but it would always be pretty unhelpful, something you'd never heard of before, you know. You say, well, they, you know what they say about John anyway. Well, no, I don't. What, what do they say? <laughs> well, apparently, you know, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's, uh... <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I'm sorry, what are you talking about? I, I don't, what? Well, do you know, if I have to spell it out, apparently he's, you know, still picking up twigs in the springtime. <laughs> oh, yes. One of the old British hairdressers. Likes his toasting on three sides, yes. <laughs> what are you talking about? Things change. Things get taken away. You get told you have to do other stuff you didn't plan on doing. You know, you have to see doctors. That happens later. This is why old people are described as boring, because they talk about things like that. That's what they know. What did you do today? Well, I went to the doctor and he said he had to take it off. <laughs> and he was going to keep it. He wouldn't even give it to me at weekends. And, uh... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have to get my front scraped. All that kind of stuff, you know, and... It's not easy being a man. You know, men have lots of health checks and, and stuff as well as women, you know. You have to look for a testicular cancer, there's nothing funny about that. You have to look for a lump in, in, in a bag of lumps. <laughs> that can take some time. <laughs> Male genitalia is particularly awful, you know, I think when when women were being designed by God or the team of Italian gay men or whoever isn't there. <laughs> it was rather a good day. Everybody was enjoying themselves with some nice wine and some food around, you know, and everybody was having a lovely time saying, molto, molto, more cars there. Funny stuff, a secret thing, a drinks holder, get them out there. So. <laughs> And when men were up for production, it was some sort of double shift deadline late on a Friday night <laughs> in Warsaw. Because they just stick people, block, stick, stick, block there. Oh, all the your genitals, bring them back. We'll use some of the elbow scrag left over from the women. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine, that'll do. That's why it's so depressing to look at, you know? This kind of bagpipes covered in hair. <laughs> because there's a gender line completely blurs as you get it, as more time goes by, you know? You both end up as these two grey, dribbling Teletubbies who <laughs> believe in kindness and biscuits and the word of God coming out of the radio. Shh! News! <laughs> oh, they're eating a lot of yogurt in China!
I think we, we were still, you know, we were supposed to be this, fulfill these models of, of strong, decisive men and, and very, very feminine, girly women, like the woman in the perfume ad, you know, was shaking her hair, just shaking her hair because it helps her think, helps her decide how she feels about things. <laughs> Staying in on a Saturday night just to shake her hair, being incredibly girly. And, and men being very decisive and saying, we're going over there, we're doing that, and it's going to take ages and we have to build a bridge to get there. Um, <laughs> I've never been one of those guys, you know? So I didn't know if it's the men who fix things and know stuff and go, yes, over there. I never, my wife says things like, the water heater seems to be, and I go, get a man! Get a man, I do not speak pipe or hammer, leave me alone. There's a bag of money and a biscuit tin in the kitchen, give it to some men. Where are you? I'm upstairs in our room, rubbing your expensive creams on my knees. I just want to see what happens. Don't try and get in. I've blocked the door with huge lumps of Turkish delight and I'm listening to show tunes. Stay away. <laughs> I don't mind that, you know. I'm not worried about that. That's natural. You become more feminized with age. I call it channeling Barbara. Something happens to me. I'm walking around the house. I suddenly get this urge to watch a load of Jane Austen adaptations and eat half a box of milk tray. So, oh, him, he's lovely. I've always liked him. Mm, he's really, really lovely. I don't like the other fellow, the hairy one. Do you like him? I don't like him. Oh, look, the lovely one's on a horse. <laughs> the thing is, you will get to a certain point in your lives. You get older, you know. You may have read about it. And people don't age well in this country. You look at them. You, don't, you see continental people, tourists, they come around. You know the people who are bicycling around in their red and yellow cagoules pointing at cathedrals? Springy, white hair and rimless, lensless, glassless spectacles, having a wonderful time, living on yogurt, going home and having sex, even though they're 8,300 years old. <laughs> Doesn't happen like that here in Britain and Ireland. You see people aging, it's all wrong. They're wearing brown, they're at bus stops, they bend over, holding a half a tin of cat food in a plastic bag, talking about the weather they haven't seen in the last 15 years. <laughs> Mumbling rubbish, getting closer to the grave so they don't have that far to jump when it actually opens up. <laughs> What's really odd is what, um, is what gets taken away from you. It's not the stuff you expect, you know? People, people talk about old age and you sort of see twinkly-eyed pictures of, you know, grandmothers and people smiling fondly at children and dogs and wheat fields and so on. Um, they're probably fucking out of their minds. They don't know where they are, but they, that's why they look so serene. But, you know, the weirdest things get taken away from you. Like, I used to have toenails. I remember them, I took pictures. And now I have the sheeting they put on battleships. My family are afraid of me, they make me clip them in the garden. I brought down three seagulls last week. Eyebrows, I had eyebrows. People used to come from nearby just to touch them. Nowadays I have these fucking things, I get shortwave radio signals on them in the evening. I wake up in the morning, it looks like giant spiders are trying to eat my eyes. Ah! No, no, you try all the old tricks, you know, because you walk into a crowded room and you suck in your gut and you see the other one underneath. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jeff, your pointless second stomach. You don't need to feed me or anything, I'm a gift from death. Because death is like the dawn saying, send him a message. The other morning, I woke up. I was frightened. I'm always frightened in the morning. I never know where I am. And, but I heard this beautiful, reassuring sound. It sounded like my childhood. I thought, what's that? Is it? There's church bells behind the hill. Or, or no, it's an ice cream van in the rain. It was me, breathing. <laughs> in the military, they use them all the time. All the regiments have their own mottos, you know. The most famous one being the SAS. Death before dishonor. Death before dishonor. I always used to wonder, hey, exactly how much dishonor are we talking about here? Because I can handle quite a lot. You know, <clears throat> I would, for instance, fillet a Smurf. Before I'd pick death. And cook him a little Smurf omelet as I was doing it, you know, I'd be very happy to do that. Season it with time and everything. I wouldn't mind listening to his happy, satisfied Smurf lips, Max. <laughs> but 
about every man thinks about Smurfs. <laughs> they don't say it, but they do, you know. That's why I'm here, to be honest. Just once, you know. What would it be like? Nobody needs to know you go away for the weekend. <laughs> Just once, to have the blue salty bulb lolling on your tongue. <laughs> if I don't say it, nobody else will. <laughs> Look at this, I'm trying to addict myself to it. It doesn't work for me, fruit. It's just God showing off. <laughs> Look at all the colors I know. <laughs> Horrible stuff. You know, if somebody comes to your house for dinner or the weekend or something, and they don't bring a bottle of wine or some chocolates or biscuits or something, you bitch about that person when they leave. You say, mean motherfucker, didn't bring anything. <laughs> you never hear anybody say they didn't bring any fruit. Not a single melon. We had them for three weeks. I didn't see a grape. <laughs> Nobody likes it. That's why they put mirrors around it in supermarkets. You just say, you catch sight of yourself and you think, fuck it, I'm dying, I better eat some of this. <laughs> they don't do that with the eclairs, do they? The best thing, really, is, 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 is wine, I think, because it's quite slow release and imaginative and, you know, and you can eat and things and talk to people. And then after a while, somebody will say, I know, I know. I know. Let's go potholing in Croatia. And you think, fine, I know a guy who can give us a lift. Me. It's not like that with beer. I think beer is actually made by, probably by food companies, you know? Just to make people stalk the streets at one in the morning going, what's that? Is it moving? Get it. It's a nun. Fry her. Fry her. And vodka is very, very deceptive because you, you, they market this to children now, you know, three-year-olds. And this is very evil because it's a very deceptive drink. You drink it and you think, what is this? This is pointless. It's, you can't taste it. You can't smell it. It's, why did we waste our money on this bloody... Why are we on a tropic island? What is... What? And whiskey is, you know, people drink a lot of that in Ireland. It's a very hard drink. It's very, uh, it, it turns you into two people, you know. One of you is very nice, you go up to total strangers and say, come in, come in, sit down, for God's sake, have something. <laughs> have my bed. <laughs> and then you go up to people you've known and loved all your life and say, get the fuck out of my house. <laughs> go, get out and leave a tip. But the most dangerous drink is, is gin. You have to be really, really careful with that. And you also have to be 45 female and sitting on a stairs. Because <laughs> gin isn't really a drink, it's more of a mascara thinner, you know? <laughs> Nobody likes my shoes! I made, I made 50 fucking volivants and not one of you, not one of you, said thank you. And my favorite, everybody shut up, shut up. This song is all about me. <laughs> Loads of people did go to Germany, actually, recently for the World Cup. A lot of English people went over to make uninformed, prejudicial remarks about German people and Germany. Totally ignorant and bigoted. N know nothing about it, but they feel free to insult it. Because they're English and they're bigoted. And because Germany is a toilet. <laughs> a truly dreadful place. Nobody ever has any reason to go there. It is, a, it is a totally dreadful place. And that's just the way it is. Because if you're talking to, uh, you know, a, a modern... I went there. On the same weekend, I went to Australia and California. And it's a... 
You see, the thing is, you're talking to a modern, nice, affable German person, and they're saying to you something like, you know, well, it's a critical time now for Germany within Europe, also globally, economically, we're pretty good, we have been better, but uh, we're very vibrant in the theater and arts and so on. All the time you listen to this, you're thinking, mm, mm, yeah, yeah, mm, mm, Hitler, 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 Hitler. <laughs> There's a Hitler when you did the Hitler thing with Hitler. Hitler, 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 Hitler. But in particular, in particular, they were very, very anti-French. You know, they built on this whole image of the weak, cheese-eating surrender monkeys was the phrase. Which is kind of good, you know. But that entirely plugged into this image of the weak, sensual, pleasure-loving French. You know, not going to war because they're all still in bed at two in the afternoon with the sheets coiled about their knees, lying there, scratching themselves, smoking a Galois inside a jeton, sweating Nice Sancerre, before one of them sloughs off the sheets to pad around the kitchen naked. No, not naked, naked from the waist down to emphasize their nakedity. <laughs> Picking up yesterday's croissant crumbs with their sweaty feet. <laughs> Slashing yesterday's paintings. <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> it's fucking rubbish! <laughs> my God! I can't believe it. It's off. I ate my paintings. I ate them! I hate your paintings too! You hate my paintings? No, I hate them! Why do we have to talk fucking English? <laughs> your work is so derivative! Because you copy mine, and mine is shit to begin with! <laughs> I'm so bored in this atelier! <laughs> stop it! Stop slashing things! Get something for breakfast, I'm starving! There's nothing, we have nothing, we're poor. Let's make love again instead of eating. No, the things you do to me. I am so sore. Even my toenails hurt. Leave me alone. Come on, you know you want it. No, get me something to eat before I die. There's nothing here I told you except chocolate bread. Where are you from exactly, by the way? I don't know, I'm Eurotrash, shut up. I'm just talking about a different time. This is when a, when a man would receive a, a phone call in a pub, on a landline. And it would be for him. Men died in pubs, sometimes on the phone. Frequently with a large ham under their arm. This is when a man would express a strong opinion on a subject he knew nothing about as a point of honor. And to emphasize his position, he would take off his hat so you would see his comb over, which was nothing to be ashamed of. It might writhe in the breeze like a cobra or a live cable, but it belonged to him. Or he might have that very, that haircut you don't see anymore, the very, very thin white hair that you can see through to the flock wallpaper on the back of the man. Wonderful, thin, white hair. People shave it off now because they think it looks cooler, the fools. They're missing out on this fantastic look of purely theoretical hair. It <laughs> looks like a thought bubble clinging to the skull. <laughs> this is also in the time when a woman had women's things. You would go to some social gathering. A woman wasn't there. You would inquire after her. Where is Jeannie? And be told, oh, Jeannie, she has women's things. And you respected that. Nobody knew what they were. She could have been at home squirting jam into envelopes. <laughs> polishing an onion with their feet. It was none of your fucking business. <laughs> Knitting a ceiling cozy. Let her get on with it. <laughs> this was also in the time when a woman, I am talking about a real woman here, had a vanity table in the bedroom to have somewhere, somewhere to sit and weep. <laughs> about all the terrible things done to her by men 
My parents' generation, you know, the baby boomers, the post-war people, they had everything. They had it right, you know, because they came to sexual maturity in the 60s and the government said to them, what, what, are you going, what, 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 what do you want it now? And they said, oh, I don't know, how about the pill? Can we get the pill? You know, I said, sure, there you go. Uh, and what, so what else is going on? Well, there's music, fine, here's the Beatles. The Stones are coming in later this evening. There's the Velvet Underground. Janis Joplin has just gone to lunch. So, if you want something to do in between now and then, I'd grow my hair and fornicate if I were you. <laughs> if things get slow, you could always paint your houses brown and orange and discover the avocado. Um, and then when it was my generation's turn, when it was our goal, you come to sexual maturity, and you say, what's going on, what do we do now? Don't fuck anybody or you die. <laughs> Never mind, here comes MC Hammer. <laughs> Not exactly a square deal. I mean, I have tried, believe me, I have tried to like rap. And it makes me feel so very, very old. I have tried to get home with the Downies. I can't do it. I understand blues music, you know? It's wonderful, a story of a people's disenfranchisement. I ain't got nothing and they're taking that away too. I haven't even got a guitar, I'm still in my fucking belly button here. Wonderful names, all those guys, you know, Blind Dead McJones. But um, with rap, it's not like that. It's all about what people have got, about attainment. You know, it's very aggressive. So you've got pecs, I've got limos, I've got bitches. My limo's powered by bitch juice and all my spare pecs are in the limo. And they, 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 they never say anything nice, ever. It's always, I'm gonna fuck you up, I'm gonna dig up your dad and shove him up your mum and drink your blood from a drinking cup, you fuck! <laughs> <laughs> and how do they lure you back into the world, into the human race, into consciousness itself, with the great traditional breakfast? As eaten here and in Britain and Ireland and lots of other places. Fried slices of dead pig, tubes of dead pig, some fungus and a chicken's period on a plate. <laughs> Welcome back! We missed you while you were sleeping. Enjoy! You can always go for the healthy option. Of course you can. Of course you can. Some yummy cereal. Mmm, -hmm, dust with milk. <laughs> Says it right there on the box. In big primary colored letters. Contains fiber. Goody gumdrops. I was up all night fantasizing about fucking fiber. <laughs> You know that feeling when you get a belly full of fibre and you can skip around the room taunting everybody who didn't get theirs? <laughs> Remember all those times in your life when you stop strangers in the street and scream at them, I need some fibre! <laughs> Lies and corruption! With Irish people, there is a thing, there is a phenomenon, and you see this all around the world. You can go anywhere. You go to Los Angeles or Seoul or Tokyo or... Minsk, anywhere. You see Irish guys and you know they're Irish because of a phenomenon called Irish hair. And it looks like this. together. I don't know why. Do you want a drink? Do you want a ham sandwich or one in my pockets? That is all from me, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Good night. Thank you. Thanks a lot.